Screen is not shared. How about now? Yes. Okay. Now it's perfect. All right. Awesome. Thank you guys and gals for logging into case reviews for January. We have another four cases that I think are going to be pretty interesting and a lot of education provided to um, us from other pe other people's experiences. My volume's okay. I'm um, calling in from a hospital, so just making sure not my normal setting. Your volume's fine. Excellent. As always, this information is confidential and privileged. Be sure to uh, not share the details, especially um, if you know know which patient um, we're talking about. So without further ado, we're going to start off with case one. EMS was called on a 45 year old female. Where husband had called um, while because the patient was laboring. Reportedly, she was unconscious. PPE usage was appropriate for the conditions. Primary surveys that this patient was unresponsive. Her airway was open, but she wasn't protecting and she was apneic. She was also pulseless. Her initial vital signs, which were obtained immediately upon arrival, was that she had no heart rate, she had no respiratory rate, and her GCS was three. Her past medical history included that she was um, hypertensive and that she had developed gestational diabetes. The history provided to EMS was that she was 39 weeks pregnant. She was in active labor with contractions every two minutes. Um, from what I could glean from the report that the husband had contacted the midwife that was supposed to help the patient deliver at home, but she wasn't on scene in that she became unresponsive, that the, I believe the midwife had was recontacted who was in route to the patient's house and told him to call 911. When he returned from making that phone call, the patient was apneic and he, had he initiated CPR. Vital signs were consistent with cardiac arrest. She was noted to be in PEA. An IGL-4 was placed in that medical control was called. I believe from the documentation that Peace Health was contacted. An IV was established, ongoing CPR, AHA, ACLS guidelines um, throughout the throughout the resuscitation. She remained in PEA or she developed PEA. She had a normal blood glucose and epi was given about seven minutes into the um, code. The uh, facility was activated, which in this case was Legacy Salmon Creek and transport was initiated approximately 11 minutes after a patient contact. In route, she remained in cardiac arrest with a PEA rhythm. Additional epi was given and she was intubated with an ET tube. She got her third dose of epi and arrived at the hospital. And then this is just the initial initial interpretation, which pretty much stayed the same throughout her encounter besides her, her uh, asystole um, with the first check. This case was reviewed by Dr. Mock and his feedback to the crews was that they thought he thought that everything possible was done to give this baby the best chance at living. The scene time was short, the setup to the hospital was key, um, allowing for rapid perimortem C-section and the outcome, although undesired, but very professional at every care of the step, um, every care or professional care at every step. The additional information that I was uh, given that I don't believe was written was that I believe that the crews had contacted the the closest hospital while they were en route to the call, notifying them that they were likely going to get a full term uh, cardiac arrest so that they could start mobilizing their teams and their resources before patient contact was even initiated. That may not be accurate, but that was one of the details I was informed of. So follow up for her. A perimortem C-section was completed. The baby was resuscitated and cooled. MRI showed a significant hypoxic injury. The brain waves or EEG showed evidence of global devastating neurological injury. On hospital day three, the siblings of this baby were able to come visit her. And on hospital day six, given the poor prognosis, the father decided to withdraw care. 
the patient had been extubated. There was no spontaneous respirations, and she had expired shortly after. So I thought that this was a great case for a lot of reasons. One of the things I hold on. Sorry, I'm also in a hospital next to my other EMS crews that are have their radio on, so I apologize for the background noise. So I thought it was a great case because of the fact that a lot of things happened that that allowed for the best possible outcome for this patient, but it also gives us an opportunity to look at what the guidelines are what, according to AHA regarding um, cardiac arrest in pregnancy. So they, according to this consensus statement in 2015, which is the most recent that I was able to find, that this, there are many similarities to standard adult cardiac arrest that are not pregnant. So they recommend to get access like we talked about um, recently where we would be preferring to have something above the diaphragm, um, large bore, and if there's any risk for delay, a humeral IO over a tibial IO. And we had talked about that in, nor in our typical adult arrest because of time to get to the heart. But also in this case with the, uh, the data that shows that with these pregnant gravid um, patients that access should be preferred to be above the diaphragm due to the potential for aorta aorto cable compression, so trying to eliminate any poor perfusion due to the gravid uterus. The CPR ratios are the same, 30 to 2 um, with our goal of 100 to 120 um, compressions per minute, no more than 10 second pauses, and approximately 80% on the chest for compressions during this arrest. Hand placement, although in previous renditions of AHA, the hand placement is to be done same as any other cardiac arrest, uh, as long as you're, there's nothing impeding your ability to do that. And that um, if you are to shock this patient, either in this setting, a cardiac arrest, but also for unstable um, arrhythmias, the jewels are going to be the same, as well as the uh, placement of the pads. The I think there's anything else. Um, no, that's basically the information that this paper had discussed. And the differences are is listed here. So continuous left uterine displacement, as you can see with the image on the right hand side, there's an option to do two hands versus one hand, which is you can kind of think of it as like, um, I know I shouldn't use sports analogies since I don't watch a lot of sports, but I imagine you can think of it as um, somebody who is uh, in football with one hand out trying to drive. So one hand out pushing the gravid uterus to the left to reduce the compression on the aorta and the inferior vena cava. Um, and then once ROSC is achieved to place the patient um, in the left lateral uh, decubitus position to continue to ins ensure that um, hypoperfusion doesn't occur secondary to the gravid uterus. Um, I put this in here as a difference because I think it bears uh, importance to mention in this particular scenario that you want to administer 100% oxygen as quickly and as early as possible, which I know that that's a standard for all of us, but I think that it, the important thing to recognize is that hypoxemia should always be considered the cause of cardiac arrest due to the uh, physiologic changes in pregnancy and that's reduced O2 reserves and increased metabolic demands. So we want to get them on oxygen and help supplement their oxygen uh, oxygen administration or oxygen access as quickly as possible. AHA also recommends against using mechanical CPR, so our Lucas devices. I don't know if this particular patient had received mechanical CPR, but my stance would be that if you can get the Lucas on the patient's chest um, and provide appropriate compressions, then it, it would be important to consider doing, especially if you're just, if you're uh, considering transporting the patient to the hospital, knowing that transportation with ongoing CPR can be reduced uh, effectiveness. And the reason why AHA recommends against the mechanical CPR is because the data isn't there to support it or to, they haven't looked at the um, survival rates in the, uh, the neurological outcomes in cardiac arrests that pertain to pregnant women. So they just don't know if it's better or worse. It's not because it's definitely worse. And then 
last other the last consideration to also consider um, also be aware of is that in a viable pregnancy, a perimortem C-section, well, in any pregnancy, but in a viable pregnancy that is in cardiac the the mother is in cardiac arrest, the consideration for a perimortem C-section, and that's usually done within four minutes of appropriate BLS and ACLS care. So this is not something that our EMS providers would be doing, but this would be something to consider for the ultimate disposition of the patient to the hospital, or if we have an EMS doc on scene, this is, or an EMS doc available in some institutions that uh, an EMS doc is available by radio and they can uh, rendezvous or if they're listening to the radio show up on these scenes. But the two important things for us to consider or to think about when we're thinking that a patient may warrant a perimortem C-section is the numbers 24 and 4. 24 rec is is mar uh, mentioned here because of the consideration of if, is this fetus viable? And that's usually occurs at 24 weeks. And if you're not sure if the patient is 24 weeks pregnant because you have limited information or a stressed out family member who can't provide that information, you can look at the, you can do a physical exam assessment and you would expect to see um, the fundus at the umbilicus at a 24 week um, pregnancy. And then four, sorry, four is, like I mentioned in the previous slide, four is if you do not have a patient regaining ROSC within four minutes of ACLS care, that's when the recommendations are for the patient to undergo a perimortem C-section, which would be potentially beneficial for both the patient and the fetus. Um, they say four minutes because the data shows that in cardiac arrest, the fetus has a 70% chance of having no neurological compromise if the perimortem C-section is done within the first five minutes of cardiac arrest. And as we go past the five minute mark, we see substantial decrease in neurological function of the fetus. Um, and then the reason why it's four minutes is because this procedure should be able to be done within one minute. So it would allow for the fetus to be delivered and resuscitated within five minutes of mom arresting. And not that. Oops. I open fire. Sorry. Not that we are um, doing this procedure, but I think it would be. I'm playing this video because this is a simulation of a perimortem C section that gives you an idea of this requires multiple people, notification of the hospital beforehand. Um, if you're bringing them to the hospital to do the C-section, although technically the only equipment you need is a scalpel and scissors, but again, not to be done by any of our EMS providers. This needs to be done by a doctor and EMS needs to be, EMS needs to be able to convey that this patient is um, a candidate for potentially a perimortem C-section as soon as uh, a appropriately appropriate um, provider is available to do it. There have been case studies where a physician has been on scene. This is usually in Europe where the ambulance actually has physicians on the ambulance, but also there have been instances in the United States where there's been an EMS physician that has performed a perimortem C-section. You obviously don't have the sterile field. You don't have all the um, extra equipment and that this has proven to have a significant improvement in um, potentially resuscitating the mom. One of the points that should be mentioned that is not going on here is that if uh, you if you are doing a perimortem C-section in a mom who has arrested, 
that CPR is ongoing with the perimortem C-section and that we've found in those in that in that, those, um, those cases and also in those um, studies that the chances of mom getting ROSC after delivery of the fetus is usually immediate if that's likely to happen. So this is just a review of our um, Clark County protocols. We don't have anything specific in here regarding uh, pregnant patients that I am aware of. And then do we have any questions regarding this particular case? I'm assuming no. All right, so going on to the second case, 23 year old meal, EMS was called for an unconscious party. PPE was appropriate. Primary survey is that this patient was unresponsive. His airway was partially obstructed, secondary to vomit, in that his respirations were agonal. His pulse was present and there was no active bleeding. Vital signs obtained immediately after patient um, contact were noted for a heart rate of approximately 130 and a respiratory rate of 24 agonal with a GCS of three. The past medical history provided was that this patient has a chronic pain history and also substance abuse. Family had contacted or family had initiated CPR prior to EMS arrival. EMS documented that the patient, the patient scene was very chaotic and out of control, and that was primarily due to the family members. There was mention that there was possible opioid use prior to his arrest and that the patient was found on the living room floor with ongoing CPR. Once EMS recognized that the patient had a pulse, they stopped um, bystander CPR. They initiated suction and they started to ventilate them. They trialed two milligrams of intranasal Narcan and they placed an eye gel when he didn't respond to that. Um, initial blood glucose was 228, an IV was established and end tidal CO2 was obtained. They again tried another two milligrams of IV Narcan, still no response. He had continuous vomiting he had continuous vomiting um, as the paramedics were mentioning to me that this patient with the eye gel in place when they took the bag valve mask off that the vomit was coming out of the eye gel um, in the same fashion as a geyser shooting across the room um, they went ahead and did everything they could to pre-oxygenate him for intubation and they rsi'd him they attempted to intubate initially through placing um, an ET tube through the eye gel, so blind intubation. That was unsuccessful. They again tried. They again tried um, with a video, which was unsuccessful, and then they again tried with DL, and they were able to um, appropriately intubate the patient and confirm. Um, confirm the ET2 placement. Suction was continued despite the uh, airway being secured and he lost IV access during transport. An IO was placed and he was um, sedated a little, a little on the longer side uh, to the point where they ended up having to give him ketamine because of the fact that he was now becoming agitated and trying to pull for the tube. Hold on one second. Thank Apologize for that. So the good in this case is that this was reversible causes were identified and um, immediately and initially aggressive airway management was pursued and PPE was appropriate. Uh, there was no documentation of a HEPA filter and then maybe earlier post intubation sedation would have prevented having to escalate sedation for him, but it worked out in the end. So um, follow up on this patient is that CT imaging of his chest upon uh, emergency room arrival showed severe bilateral pulmonary consolidations 
concerning for a massive aspiration. He was also noted to have rib fractures, which they attributed to the CPR done by his family members. And during his hospitalization, he developed a PE, which he started on anticoagulation for. He remained encephalopathic, but he um, was gradually improving. And due to his severe ARDS, he was still intubated. So I'd like to talk a little bit about blind eye gel endotracheal intubation. Ideally, we would like to intubate with RSI and with video laryngoscopy, but when we find ourselves having having problems with um, intubating in our standard fashion, we always have the backup of a supraglottic airway, but we might, in, in particular cases, like this, we may, and a supraglottic airway may not be appropriate or adequate enough to continue to adequately ventilate a patient. So what I would say is that ideally we would have fiber optic um, capability to intubate through the eye gel, but when we don't, such as in a pre-hospital setting, there, there are certain situations like this one where blind intubation should be considered if all other measures are unsuccessful because Blind intubation, according to studies, show a success rate anywhere from 50 to 97 percent with the use of an eye gel. Um, so I would say if we're going to be attempting blind eye gel endotracheal intubation, that there are certain maneuvers that might improve your odds of success. So inserting the eye gel, like the recommendation from the um, manufacturer, which is the sniffing morning air position, lubricating the ET tube copiously, I think if the patient is uh, having massive vomiting that probably is lubricated, uh, don't need to add, add additional. And then the picture up here in the upper right shows an ET tube placed through the eye gel. And you can see that the um, bevel of the ET tube is faced in a position that should prevent it from um, impinging on the glottic uh, structures. So if you can try to advance the ET tube through the eye gel like that, then the odds are likely that you have a better chance of being successful. But if you find any difficulty with passing the uh, ET tube, like any kind of resistance, they recommend rotating the ET tube approximately 90 degrees counterclockwise to try to get to that position. Um, and if you're having any difficulties or if you want to start with, you can try external laryngeal manipulation and then um, the recommendations is that you want to use an ET tube, this three, um, use the eye gel size plus three. So you could go down a tube size to try to improve your odds of uh, passing an ET tube. And when you do pass it, you're placing it all the way until the ET tube is hubbed in the eye gel. I would not recommend taking out the eye gel at that point if you're successful. Leave it in place. It also works as a bite block. One of the things, um, and then how do you know if it's successful? You're looking for chest rise with ventilation and continuous end tidal CO2. Of the studies that I was reviewing for this presentation, none of them talked about using a bougie. So given that information, I would say just a blind, blind ET tube, no bougie, um, unless you have the ability to do fiber optic, which is more in the hospital, is for all that I know, all in the hospital setting. This is a video. Blind of annual laryngoscopy involves reaching around the patient's neck with your right hand and applying pressure on the thyroid cartilage. This simple and fast maneuver does two important things. First, the opposing forces of the blade tip and external manipulation drive the tip of the curved blade fully into the vollecula, causing effective epiglottis elevation. Second, it pushes the larynx backward into better alignment with the laryngoscopist's line of sight. Bimanual laryngoscopy, or ELM, is not cricoid pressure. Cricoid pressure is done by an assistant to prevent passive regurgitation of stomach contents in high-risk aspiration situations. Bimanual laryngoscopy is deliberately done to improve laryngeal view. The goal is first-pass success and avoiding episodes of bag mask ventilation, fine movements of the blade tip at the vollecula, and subtle changes in pressure and direction of force can cause dramatic differences in laryngeal exposure. 
Bimanual laryngoscopy is about connecting these fine movements at the anterior neck with direct observation of laryngeal view. After the All right. Any questions about case two? Thought I heard some. No. All right. So moving on. Case three 58 year old female. Initial assessment is that the patient had chest pain, or the initial complaint is the patient had chest pain and she wasn't alert um, per radio dispatch. PPE uh, dawn was appropriate for the circumstances. The patient was awake. Her airway was open. She was protecting, but she was labored. Her pulse was present when there was no active bleeding. Vital signs were significant for a heart rate of 159. Blood pressure was not obtained. Respiratory rate of 38. And her initial SpO2 was 70% and tidal of 36. Um, her weight was 113 kilos, and she had a BMI of 40. Um, past medical history includes COPD, on-home oxygen of 2 liters, and um, she was also a diabetic. And the history that was provided to EMS was that she had a sudden onset of shortness of breath, that she had recently had a reported hemopneumothorax seven weeks prior, and that her left lung, well, of her left lung, and that left lung only was 50% functional. So initial presentation um, due to her extremis 15 liter non rebreather was placed, uh, vital signs that we talked about in the previous slide. She was treated with bronchodilators, um, both after atrovent and albuterol, I apologize as a typo, and she was given solumedrol. It was noted that her breast sounds on the left lower lobe were diminished and the her breast sounds on the left lower lobe were absent in that her right side had diminished breast sounds. Her SATs did improve with these interventions to the low 80s and uh, transport was initiated 17 minutes um, upon patient contact. A 12 lead was obtained and vital signs were repeated a few more times. Um, CPAP was not placed because of a possible hemonumo. And in reviewing this case, I thought that EMS did a great job on shortness of breath differential diagnosis as well as management. There was early medication administration and they chose to hold CPAP appropriately. Um, earlier vital signs would be would be uh, a good idea and the only thing is that and it's not really the bad but consideration of needle decompression although as you can see this patient although she is in distress is not hemodynamically unstable but a second blood pressure would be appropriate to confirm that she is stable at least in the um, blood pressure uh, side of things so in the emergency room I actually took care of this patient. Uh, chest x-ray was obtained. She had a, a large left-sided pneumothorax. Uh, chest tube was placed. She was, I would say, although she didn't have tension physiology um, uh, based off of her chest x-ray or her um, vital signs. Hold on one second. Can you go, please? You're coughing too much for me you to be here. So um, we, we uh, worked on a emergent chest tube placement. Uh, my process for her is that I didn't think that she would tolerate laying flat without having uh, acute worsening in her shortness of breath. So we sedated her and performed a finger thoracotomy to help alleviate the pneumothorax that she had and then laid her flat in order to place the chest tube, um, which went well, she didn't decompensate. She had significant improvement of her shortness of breath with the thoracotomy um, and a chest tube was placed. She was admitted and she had her chest tube removed on hospital day three and discharged on hospital day five. This patient showed up less than a month later after this, uh, this um, presentation, again with shortness of breath, um, again with a large left-sided pneumothorax, 
I had put in a, a, a traditional chest tube. The second encounter at Peace Health, they tried to put in a pigtail catheter. And for those of you guys that are not familiar with a pigtail catheter, it's a substantially smaller tube that allows for decompression of a, um, a, a pneumothorax. It's not used for fluid, um, blood, or pleural fusion. Uh, but she was extremely difficult to place that pigtail in the event. And in fact, she actually never got the pigtail placed despite three attempts. And the reason why it was so difficult to place this pigtail catheter, which would be virtually difficult for us in the pre-hospital setting to do a needle decompression was because of her body habitus. As I mentioned before, her BMI was 40 and she had large pendulous breasts. When I had done her chest tube, I had to have um, a person assigned solely to hold her breast and pull it all the way over to the right side in order to stretch the skin and decrease the amount of adipose tissue that was relaxed in, to place the, the chest tube. Um, even though we did the same attempt, I assisted with the uh, her subsequent presentation that the five inch um, the five inch needle still couldn't get to the uh, intercostal space appropriately and they had to convert after the uh, multiple failed pigtail attempts to a chest tube, a traditional chest tube as well. She was transferred to Sunnyside um, where she had a VATS procedure, a video, video assisted thoracic surgery um, with a lung re wedge resection of the affected areas of her left lung and talc pleuridesis. So I think this is a good opportunity to talk a little bit about pneumothoraxes and um, when we need to intervene. So when a pneumo, I think that um, you can think of it as like simple pneumothoraxes. In this image here, the simple pneumothoraxes fall into the spontaneous or the um, non-spontaneous uh, presentation. So a primary one would be no abnormal lung physiology and it, they just have a spontaneous pneumo where a secondary spontaneous pneumo is with underlying lung injury or lung disease that um, in, in, uh, that contributed to the pneumothorax. So like in her case, a bleb with a COPD history. There are traumatic ones, either from blunt or penetrating trauma or iatrogenic ones, ones that we cause not intentionally, but part of our medical management. When, so the, the lung physiology is that the pleural cavity has a negative thoracic pressure in the lung and the outside environment of the chest is positive. And this pressure gradient allows the lungs to not collapse. When there's a rupture to the, um, to either the pleural or, or parietal or visceral pleura, that allows for air to be to escape into this pleural space and not evacuate. So as we continue to ventilate um, either the patient or positive pressure ventilation, more air gets trapped in that pleural space, causing that negative thoracic pressure to lose its pressure gradient and become more positive and increasing the pressure on the lung, compressing it to the point where it can completely compress it and potentially cause it to shift to the unaffected side, compressing the blood vessels in the mediastinum and in the, um, as well as the heart. And then the increased intrathoracic pressure decreases the venous return to the heart as well. So kind of uh, multiple factors making this um, substantially worse. Patients with a pneumothorax aren't always symptomatic. They can be asymptomatic, but those are usually small pneumothoraxes um, as, or small, yes, we're just saying pneumothoraxes, where um, if they do become symptomatic, they're usually complaining of pleuritic chest pain, um, shortness of breath, and your physical exam should uh, key you in as well. Attention pneumothorax is the indication where we need in the pre-hospital setting to act upon this um, quickly. And they're the same they can have the same presentation as a pneumothorax plus the hemodynamic instability uh, factor. So that's the things that we need to be looking for when we're looking at patients with a pneumothorax. Um, are they hemodynamically unstable? So you may see distended neck veins. You may see tracheal deviation, although that would cons that would be kind of a late finding if you're waiting for that to happen. You're looking for worsening hemodynamic um, uh, trending. 
And I say here it's a clinical diagnosis. Even in the hospital, we don't want to recognize attention pneumo on a chest X-ray or a CT. We want to assess the patient, see the instability, or that they're in cardiac arrest, and go straight to managing this quickly. And then I queried a couple of um, our EMS leaders. It looks like most of us have the ARS and um, our one agency that uses just an angiocath. Uh, but this video next is a ARS video. One, select site, affected side, second intercostal space, midclavicular line. For reference, you should never insert a needle closer to the center of the chest than a line drawn from the nipple straight up to the collarbone. Step two, cleanse a site with antimicrobial solution. That may just be the alcohol unless we Step have three, chlorhexidine. Remove red cap with twisting motion. Step four. Remove ARS from case. Step five, insert the needle into the skin over the superior border of the third rib, mid clavicular line, and direct it into the intercostal space at a 90 degree angle to the chest wall. An audible rush of air may be heard from the needle. Step six, remove the needle and leave the catheter in place. Consider securing the catheter to the chest with tape. There is no need to create a flutter valve or attach a three-way stopcock for this catheter. Remember to periodically reevaluate the casualty. If progressive respiratory distress redevelops, assume that the catheter is no longer effectively ventilating the pneumothorax. The rescuer may either attempt to flush the catheter with sterile saline or other sterile IV solution, or repeat the procedure with another ARS placed adjacent to the first ARS. Does anyone have any questions about this case? One other thing I would add, um, maybe more particularly with the agencies that have just a, uh, a non-commercial grade created uh, needle decompression device, like a, such as like just an angiocath, is that you could find improvement in placing that um, catheter if you're having any difficulty with advancing it by placing a, a small nick in the skin to facilitate um, getting overcoming the uh, increased um, resistance from the skin itself. This is not a deep cut. This is a very superficial cut. Mark, I'm not able to see the comments. Is there any comments before I move on? No comments. Okay. Having computer problems. There we go. All right. So reviewing our protocols regarding this use of CPAP. The contraindication, which is absolute, would include a pneumothorax. Um, and the reason why that it's an absolute contraindication is that positive pressure ventilation will, will speed up the progression of a simple pneumothorax to a tension pneumothorax. So really don't want to make this patient progressively worse and need to intervene quicker than we absolutely need to or potentially go into cardiac arrest. Other contraindications would be for CPAP is respiratory arrest, agonal respiration, so anything that's um, ineffective ventilations in any facial anomalies um, or facial trauma. Well, with our protocol for pleural decompression, we have two sites, um, but again, this is for a rapidly deteriorating patient with a history that Either, either is likely for a secondary cause of a pneumothorax or um, your physical exam is highly suggestive of a pneumothorax and the patient has to be hemodynamically unstable. So, or I guess I should say 
you have a high suspicion that this patient has a tension pneumothorax. So you would go forward with needle decompression. Your two sites would be your second intercostal midclavicular space, and that's what you'd use for an average size adult in pediatrics or the fourth or fifth intercostal space above the mid axillary line if the patient is large or heavily muscled. Um, if they're a skinny person, you can sometimes use the nipple as a guide to trying to palpate your anatomy. Um, if they're not skinny or if they have pendulous breasts, that will not be helpful. You'll be needling too low. Um, you want to insert a large bore at least four inches over the needle catheter, over the superior rib margin. Um, the reason why it's superior rib is just a reminder for everybody is that you don't want to hit any nerve or vascular bundles, which fall under, which are underlying the rib. And you remove that needle, um, proceed with, uh, with management of any, um, any complications with placement of this. All right, so case four, 64 year old male. Chief complaint, shortness of breath. PPE was appropriate for the um, circumstances. The patient was found to be awake. His airway was open, he was protecting, but he was noted to be tachypnic. His pulse was present and there was no active hemorrhage. Uh, vital signs, which were a little delayed, showed that he had a heart rate of 92. He had a blood pressure of 164 over 58 normal respiratory rate, GCS of 14, and um, documented an SpO2 of 97%. His past medical history includes diabetes, chronic kidney disease on hemodialysis, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and GERD. And the information provided to our EMS colleagues was that the patient was at a skilled nursing facility and that when he awoke, he was short of breath. One of the nurses had checked his blood glucose, noting that it was 64. The nurse had treated him with a meter dose inhaler and gave him some orange juice. And the additional information provided was that this patient had missed dialysis sec two appointments secondary to his weakness. He was placed on a nasal cannula oxygen. An IV was established. A 12 lead was later obtained. And vital signs were repeated, largely unchanged from the initial his repeat glucose um, at that time was uh, 79, and he had multiple 12 leads, which were all consistent with the one I'll show you here shortly. Transport was initiated, and a uh, decision was made to treat for ho possible hyperkalemia with one gram of calcium glu uh, glu gluconate. And I don't believe there was any repeat EKGs after that. So this is a pre-hospital EKG. You can see that he's not tachycardic or bradycardic, but he does look like there's conduction delay with a left bundle branch block and a first degree um, AV block. So access was obtained pretty quickly. Uh, index of suspicion for a possible significant abnormality such as um, electrolyte derangement was high. Uh, it was clear that this patient, although reported short of breath, was not in extremis and that there was something else going on. Uh, the crews were able to initiate the cardiac stabilizing medication. They continued to monitor him um, throughout his encounter and that where I think there could be room for improvement is getting a 12 lead early on, especially if you're worried about a condition such as hyperkalemia or another reason for him to have his shortness of breath and then earlier obtain a, obtainment of vital signs. There may have been some conditions on scene that prevented it from occurring earlier, but I believe it was 11 minutes or so from the first uh, documented vital signs. Okay, In the emergency room, he was reportedly hypoxic on scene, so that's probably why he was on, placed on nasal cannula. A 12 lead EKG was obtained, which was consistent with EMS had. We have the added luxury of comparing it to his old EKG from a few months earlier. So clearly he has significant conduction delays compared to the one that he presents with, as well as, um, as well as, 
he has evidence to suggest that he might be hyperkalemic with his T waves. If you note um, on V4, that is V4, V5, I'd say V4 is probably pretty much the another thing that you would be looking at. Ideally, you'd be seeing peak T waves throughout, but given the combination of the PR prolongation, the QRS prolongation, um, and the missed dialysis, he was initiated on management of hyperkalemia prior to the labs returning. His his uh, potassium was 7.2. He was admitted for emergent dialysis and metabolic acidosis, as well as um, uremia, and uh, he became hypoglycemic during his ER encounter, largely because of his um, renal failure and his uh, shifting meds. His hospital course, he received his emergent dialysis on the day of presentation, and then each day um, for the next three after that, he normally dialyzes every other, and he was discharged on hospital day number four. So a little bit more about hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia, depending on what lab lab data you're looking at, is greater than 5 or 5.5 milliequivalents per liter and that you usually see symptoms when you have high levels of hyperkalemia, such as 6.5 to 7. And those symptoms can be weakness, fatigue, palpitations, or syncope, uh, largely in part by the, by the arrhythmias the patient sustains, and as well as cardiac arrest, I guess could be another potential presentation with um, this symptomology. The rate of change is more important than the value. So what that means is that if this is a patient that has and is often hyperkalemic because they don't always dialyze like they're supposed to, their body has learned to tolerate higher levels of potassium, whereas a patient who has normal potassium levels has very little tolerance for small changes in the potassium. So you may find that you know, you get called to a patient's home with an abnormal lab and you find out their potassium was elevated. You get a 12 lead, you do your vital sign checks, and you may be like, this patient is largely stable, where um, someone with a younger person or a person that doesn't have um, recurrent hyperkalemic uh, presentations will be very symptomatic uh, with an elevation in the potassium of a, of a smaller uh, change. And then historical clues that would help you in determining that this patient might be uh, might be experiencing hyperkalemia is a patient with renal disease, if they're a diabetic, if they're receiving chemo, if they have sustained significant trauma, such as like a crush injury, or you think that there are signs and symptoms of rhabdo, so a patient who's been on the ground for a prolonged period of time, um, medications that should uh, should be on your differential for increased potassium presentation would be digoxin, any of our potassium sparing diuretics, um, any of our ACE inhibitors, and NSAIDs such as like ibuprofen. The image here on the right gives you a a textbook change in EKG findings based off of their potassium levels. So the first one on the top is a normal value um, and a normal EKG. You'll see peaked T waves potentially with potassium levels of 5.5 to 6.5. You'll see um, a widened PR interval or widened QRS duration in addition to the in addition to the peak T waves with values between 6.5 and 8, and then values greater than 8. Uh, usually, or well, 7 to 8 will have widening of the QRS potentially goes on to sine wave uh, physiology or sine wave presentation and asystole or, or VTAC or VFib as the potassium rises above eight. This is an EKG, not from us, but I put it in here because uh, one of the social media EMS doc sites um, had documented that EMS had told them that they were getting a slow VTAC patient. So slow VTAC, you should probably be looking at, is this hyperkalemic? Should I be managing and treating this patient as slow VTAC in the right setting is probably hyperkalemia. Um, management, sorry. Um, management or treatment, it's going to be the first